Hello, welcome to part two of this lecture on chapter 21. Again, if you're not following along the book, then this is just lecture 14, so there you go. This time we're talking about planets outside of our solar system, which we term exoplanets. But like I pointed out last time, we were talking about the birth of stars. So they pretty much always come with these disks surround the equator of the star. Here we have some images of some disks, and yeah, I think I guess these are in the Orion Nebula, constellation Orion, and so these are just some stars in the process of forming, and they all have dark disks around them, right? So that's that dust. It's generally dark because light doesn't go through it. It's not giving off light, though. I think this is visible pictures. If you looked in the infrared, it'd probably look a little different. That dust might be glowing, it might be heated up in the infrared. Yeah, each of these stars is pretty young, not more than a million years old. And the disks are pretty large. I think I pointed out the rough size of these disks in the last lecture, but each of these disks is something like two to eight times the orbit of Pluto. So, you don't really consider Pluto a planet anymore, but sometimes it's used, or its orbit is sometimes used as like a rough scale of our solar system, which is, roughly speaking, about 40 astronomical units. 40 times the distance the Earth is from the Sun, that's about the orbit of Pluto, and each of these disks is even larger than that. That would be, what, 80 AU to 8 times uh, 320 astronomical units? Very large, very large. Um, beyond being large, they have a decent amount of mass, typically between 1 and 10 percent the mass of our Sun, and this is plenty of material to form planets. If you recall, all of the planets in our solar system are less than 1 percent the mass of the Sun. The Sun makes up like 99, over 99 percent of the mass in our solar system. So having 1 to 10 percent of that mass is plenty to make a number of planets. So I told you about this process a while ago when we were talking about the formation of our solar system. Our solar system is fairly typical. Sun of a pretty typical size. Number of planets that formed from the disk around our sun when it was forming. It seems to be a fairly standard thing. So here I just have some sort of time scales of how the um, disk eventually evolves into planets. It seems to be that for about uh, one to three million years, the disk that is formed around that star goes like right up to the star. Right? But around that time, we notice that the inner parts of the disk start clearing out. And this is pretty much, you know, like clumps of that dust in the inner part of the system that near the star are sort of clumping together more and more, coming in larger and larger clumps. And as they get together, you know, they form these fairly large clumps and start sweeping out the dust that's near that star. So you start clearing out um, that inner area. And that seems to take up to about 10 million years. By that time, the inner area or near the star, the disk that is near the star has pretty much been cleared out, collected into some large clumps. So that period, after about three million years and anywhere from up to like 30 million years seems to be about the time that it takes planets to form or about that timeline during the star formation that it take that the planets are forming and three to 30 million years is like nothing on cosmic time scales so then the rest of the disks seem to be pretty much either swept up by planets that have formed and just start picking up the dust as they go around or they're blown away by the stellar winds from the star once the nuclear fusion begins and starts blowing out its stellar winds. So that all sweeps away the rest of the dust one way or another by about 10 to 30 million years, which is probably why planets don't form much longer than 30 million years because there's no more material just laying around for it to form. That is, however, unless the star is pulling more material in or that system is you know, still within a molecular cloud, and there might be dust and gas that's still uh, collapsing into the uh, system there. 
So after that, like 10 to 30 million years, we have planets, and most of the small dust has been cleared. But there still generally seems to be quite a lot of debris, that being like asteroids and comets and such. And so the next period, relatively long period, uh, like 400 to 500 million years, is a pretty chaotic time in this planetary formation where the planets can be bombarded by comets and asteroids and even just other planets that are forming protoplanet sized kind of things are running into each other. Stuff like Thea, the theoretical object that hit the Earth a long time ago to form a moon in that time period is when that sort of stuff seems to be happening. The animation here is just of a, a disc that has formed around a star and it's kind of nice. I also put a link to a YouTube video, I'm not going to show it here, but it's a pretty nice, short, and pretty looking uh, video put together by NASA, part of the James Webb Space Telescope project. Nicely illustrates planetary formation, so definitely recommend going and just checking that out. Hope you guys long. But if you notice, when the protostars have those disks, we see the disks fairly easily, possibly just by them being dark areas right around uh, stars, newly formed stars, possibly by looking in infrared and seeing them glowing. But as the planets start to form, that disk starts to get cleared out. Right? And we say cleared out, like we just don't see the disk anymore. And also, for the most part, we're not really seeing the planets directly either. So it turns out that that like, really dispersed dust disk is a lot easier to see than when that dust forms into planets. Pretty hard to see exoplanets. We have some images here of some uh, young stars with their disks around. And the left image in each of these pictures is an actual observation. You might notice that the central area in those images is just dark. And that's because they're using an occulting disk. Occultating, occultating disk. Uh, it's just a disk to block out the light from the star itself. Because otherwise, the light from that star just washes out anything else you want to see. Much like looking at the sun, or trying to look at the atmosphere of the sun, like the photosphere and the um, corona, will put a solid disk that will cover up the sun itself so you can see the stuff around it. Same thing happening here. And then next to each of those images is sort of uh, interpretations or like uh, I think actually maybe even simulations of what um, these systems probably look like. And if you notice, you can see the star and you can see the disk and maybe you can see a cleared out area near the star in the left one. But seeing planets, you don't even see them. This begs the question, how do we observe exoplanets? Well, it's hard. The first confirmed observation of an exoplanet was less than 30 years ago, I think 1995. Since then, we've observed a good number of them using a couple different techniques. So we'll talk about those. So for one, we have indirect techniques where we are able to say that there is a planet there, not necessarily by seeing the planet itself, but by seeing how the planet might affect the star that's orbiting around. So there's two sorts of methods within that indirect category. One is like a wobbling of the star, and the other is a dimming of the star. We'll talk about both of those. And the other category of methods is, of course, just directly imaging them. And right? you can see them directly, and that's rather difficult. Right? So typically, the stuff that we see when we look out in the cosmos is either, well, it's all really far away. Some of it is incredibly far away, mind-boggling far away. But it's all very far away. So the only time, or the way that we see these things, because they're giving off light, they're probably giving off a lot of light, like stars or that hot interstellar gas, um, or they just take up a large portion of the sky. Like at night, you can see the Milky Way, and that's gas and dust for the most part that you're seeing, but partly you see it just because it's so darn big in our view. Planets are neither of those things. They're not big, and they don't give off light, much light. They reflect a little bit of light from their stars, but it's really not. I think I showed you this image a while back, but this is a protoplanetary disk, or a disk around a star where planets are forming, and it's 
one that's sort of like face on to us or uh, from our perspective. We can look sort of down on the disc. And it's pretty nice. You can see these sorts of areas. Like right near the star, there's a cleared out sort of area. But actually, there's also these rings that are being cleared out as well. And that is almost certainly because there are planets that are forming in those dark areas and they're sweeping those areas out. So they're clearing them out of the dust. We're sweeping up the dust and becoming part of the planet. So for the indirect detection, first we talk about this sort of wobble method. And in order to understand that, we need to go back to the idea of orbits and think about the fact that it's gravity that's causing the planets to orbit around the sun. Right? The sun has a gravitational field and it pulls on the planets and the planets have this rotational velocity and so they end up constantly being pulled towards the sun but also constantly sort of missing the sun and just continuing around the circle. It's also true though that the planets are pulling on the sun. Gravity goes both ways. All mass pulls on each other. Right? So planets pull on the sun, the sun pulls on the planets. For the most part, we don't really notice the pull of the planets on the sun in our solar system because the sun is so much larger than the planets. Even Jupiter is like 0.1% the mass of the sun. So we, don't, we wouldn't really notice it easily, but if you're looking for it and you have very sensitive instruments, you can detect it. The animation on the left there is a way to see or visualize how a planet going around a, a star, even though the star is, say, much bigger than the planet, the planet does actually cause the star to orbit a little bit, cause it to move around, and that's what we're calling a sort of wobble. The star wobbles around a little bit. And even that Ill, uh, animation is rather exaggerated. The motion of the star is very tiny. Now with the understanding that stars are actually wobbling a little bit, the planets are pulling on them and they start moving around a little bit, then we have to recall that when an object moves away from us or moves towards us, it has a Doppler shift. The spectrum of the light coming from that star will be Doppler shifted. When it's moving away from us, uh, it's shifted towards the red, longer wavelengths. When it's moving towards us, it's shifted towards the blue, shorter wavelengths. It's sort of like moving away, the wavelengths kind of stretch out, get longer. Moving towards us, they get switched, get shorter. So that's what this image on the right is showing. And again, it's greatly exaggerated, the motion of the star there. Um, but what we can see is because of that wobble of the star, sometimes the star is moving towards us a little bit, and its uh, spectra is going to be blue shifted, and sometimes it's moving away from us a little bit, and its spectra would be red shifted. These shifts are very tiny because the wobble is very tiny overall. Um, and remember that Doppler shift, uh, the amount that that shift is going to happen is sort of proportional to the speed that the object is moving towards us or away from us. So these shifts are very tiny, but we've developed very sensitive technologies in order to be able to still measure these shifts. So this was in fact how we uh, detected the first exoplanet in 1995. So the other indirect technique for observing an exoplanet is the dimming. You watch the dimming of a star. And this technique goes back to a similar idea that we looked at before when we were talking about measuring the size of stars. And when we were doing that, it had to do with thinking about binary star systems. And you had one uh, star passing in front of the other. And we looked at the light curves of these star systems. So the same sort of idea here, except that now you can imagine that these are planets that are crossing in front of their parent star. And when they cross in front of it, from our point of view, that's what we call a transit. So the image on the left is showing a planet that's starting to go through this transit across its star. And the light curve is just how bright the light is from that star over time. So it starts out at a certain brightness, however bright it is. And as the planet goes in front of it, it starts to block out a little bit of that star's light, and so the brightness of that star dims a little bit. And as it gets fully in front of it, it drops down to as dim as it's going to do, or it's dimmed as much as it's going to, and then as it starts to leave the other side, it's going to stop blocking that light, and the 
light curve and the brightness of that star is going to raise back up until it gets to that same brightness, which is the brightness of that star without anything in front of it. The animation is showing the same sort of thing. It's a nice visualization. You watch the planet go around, and as it comes in front of the star, the light, the brightness of the star dips down, it's dimmer for a little bit, and then comes back up as the planet finishes transiting. A couple of things about this method is the dimming that happens is generally very small amount, and so it's difficult to detect. It becomes easier to detect if the planet that you're observing is very large, like a Jupiter-sized planet, and it's close to that star. The closer it is to that star, the more of that light it's going to block out, the dimmer it's going to make that star as it goes in front, so it's easier to observe. So this method is somewhat biased towards large planets that are close to their star. Beyond that, hopefully you can see that this method only works for systems that are edge-on to us. Edge-on meaning that the orbital plane is like here, the planets are orbiting in this direction, the star is in the middle, so that from our point of view, we actually can see the planet crossing the star. If it's space on, then the planets never transit their star. This method doesn't work. Luckily for us, there are plenty of planetary systems that are like this. And also, our uh, technology is getting better and better, so this sort of bias of seeing very large planets only that are close to the star has uh, gotten a little bit better, because it really depends on, like, how small of a dimming can you discern? You can look at the brightness of this star, and if it dims just this tiny little bit, can I make that out? And if I can, then the smaller I can make that out, the sort of the smaller or further out planets I can observe around stars. The first observation only being in 1995 is pretty recent, but there have been a couple of missions since then that have really upped our game, sort of, in hunting for exoplanets. One of those was was called the Kepler spacecraft, or the Kepler mission. I guess maybe the same thing. And that's an image of it. I think it might just be an illustration of it. That's not actually in space. Sort of a composite image. Um, but it's showing where Kepler was looking in the sky. It gets in that boxed region, which is near the constellation Cygnus. So it sort of surveyed the sky and looked for systems that were edge-on and tried to watch uh, for dimming of the stars in those uh, systems. So this mission was specifically using that dimming method. And I guess it observed or sort of checked out um, a lot of stars, 150,000 stars, to find transiting planets and it detected about 2,500 of them. Just in that little spot of the sky that's about the size of a, a constellation. And again, that's just edge-on systems, just planetary systems that are edge-on to us, and it definitely didn't detect all the planets even in those systems, right? Because some of them are just too small, and their dimming just doesn't really do enough for us to detect that that planet did transit its star. So those were the indirect methods but like I said, we've also gotten good enough where we've actually been able to image some exoplanets directly. So shown here is an example of one such observation, which is a planetary system, I guess known as HR8799. And the system apparently is in the Pegasus constellation, somewhere in that area of the sky at least. You know. So on the left there is a just one image, and in the center, again, the star is being blocked out by this dark disk, so we can better see the light and the stuff around it. And the stuff around it, we can see fairly well, at least a couple of planets, four planets. And then on the right is an animation where a number of observations that were taken over a few years, 2009 to 2016, yeah, somewhere in that range, we kept watching this system, which again is uh, sort of face on, we're looking straight down on that uh, system so we can actually see it's orbiting like this. Very nice. And so we can see there, I mean, see them in the process of their orbit. Right? We weren't videotaping this like the whole time. This is a bunch of different images and then uh, use a computer to sort of uh, interpolate between those positions. Pretty cool though.
I'm watching another solar system. So this method, this direct detection method, is also biased in that it sort of works best, uh, currently at least, for very large planets for one. It's easier to see things that are larger, so like Jupiter size or larger than that. And also generally works best for planets that are fairly young still. The reason being is that they're still pretty warm and they give off a good bit of infrared radiation. If you recall in that planetary formation period, you have like planetesimals smashing into protoplanets and heating them up and causing that process of differentiation where heavier stuff starts to sink towards the middle, right? But that stuff needs to be hot enough for all that stuff to be liquid. So in that early period, they're still pretty warm. I'm pretty sure these are infrared images. So large planets that are still pretty young and also that have pretty large orbits. And that being because when they're too close to the sun, it's hard to differentiate their light from the sun's light. You get close enough to the sun, or the star, and you just get washed out by the star's light. So if you notice in this image, that line shown there is 20 astronomical units, which is already like the orbit of Saturn, something like that, right? Pretty large. So even the closest in orbit there is quite large compared to like our solar system at least. Oh, sorry. The, or is about the size of Neptune's orbit, so even further out than Saturn. This is a pretty nice plot, but it just has a whole bunch of dots on it. And I guess the central takeaway is that each of those dots is an exoplanet that we've detected. They're plotted for their orbital period, how long they take to orbit their star, and their radius. So Earth radius, we're calling radius one, so these are compared to the radius of Earth, right? One, and four times Earth's radius is about the size of Neptune. A little over ten times that is the size of Jupiter. So these horizontal bars are sort of giving you uh, landmarks of like the size of these planets. And I haven't really talked much about it before. So it maybe it's, I don't know. But some of the scales, plenty of the scales that actually that we've looked at are what we call logarithmic scales, meaning that the major like ticks don't just go like one, two, three, four, five. They'll go one and then ten times that, ten, and then to another ten times that, a hundred. Meaning that each of the major chunks there is ten times larger than the one before. So if I try to find Earth on here, where Earth would be on this plot, right? radius is one Earth radius, and its orbital period is about 365 days. So it's between that hundred and a thousand, and it's like three to four ticks over. Three hundred and sixty-five, or about between three and four hundred days. So it's actually near, right in the area of those like three little dots that are sort of away from the rest of the group there. Um, the color of these dots is indicating the technique that was used to observe them. So I think it says that the yellow and that purple or red, whatever ones, were detected via the dimming method we're talking about, right? so a planet transiting the star, and the blue ones are detected by their Doppler. So there's a lot of them. On this graph, uh, I think it's about 3,500 exoplanets, and the last time I looked up, we are now somewhere in the vicinity of 5,000 exoplanets observed at this point. We're not going to say much more about it here, but beyond just measuring their um, rough size and orbital period, we're even kind of approaching the point and getting just to that point too, where we can detect light that has passed through the planet's atmospheres, if they have an atmosphere. Then as that planet transits in front of the sun, some of that light is passing through the atmosphere, meaning it's going to pick up absorption lines from the elements that are in the atmosphere of that planet. And so when we look at the spectra coming from a planet that's transiting its star, we're kind of just about at that point where we can actually start saying what that atmosphere is made up of, or at least some of the things that are in the atmosphere.
So here we have two graphs, and the one on the left is basically just plotting all the planets that Kepler observed, the Kepler mission. And that, again, is sort of biased towards larger planets. So these are uh, plotted on the bottom is the size of the planet. It's relative to the size of Earth. Right? So one on there is the size of Earth. Two is two times the size of Earth. Neptune is about four times the size of Earth. And then along the top, um, roughly where each of the planets in our system falls, Mercury, rather small. Mars, also rather small. Venus, similar size to Earth. Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. So if we just look at the data that Kepler collected, it would seem that most of the planets are in a size range that's like 1.4 to 2.8 times the size of Earth. So those are the two highest bars in there. And it's just a little bit odd because we don't have any planets like that in our solar system. So it's a little bit odd. But again, Kepler's observational technique is biased towards larger planets. So what we can do is utilize uh, statistics. We can estimate the actual distribution of exoplanets around their stars. So on the right here is an estimate of the number of planets in a given size range that we would expect to find around a star. So it's probably the case that most, or that there are a lot of rather small planets, relatively small planets, around uh, stars. So when we take into account the fact that Kepler was biased, we would predict that the largest sort of bars in this chart are the ones that are between 1 and 2.8 times uh, the size of Earth. So it's still the case that we seem to find a lot of planets that are in a size range that we don't have in our solar system. And so we come up with some names for those kind of planets that are that size. That region that's like 1.4 to 2.8 times the size of Earth, we call those super-Earths. And Neptune, remember again, is about four times the size of Earth. And so between 2.8 and four times the size of Earth, we call those mini-Neptune. So those are some of the planets that we've seen a lot of elsewhere, but we just don't really have here. A topic of interest that comes up when you're talking about exoplanets is, well, is there going to be life on those planets? Hard to say. Um, one thing that we have tried to look at is the possibility for liquid water to exist on an exoplanet. So from our perspective, and the way we've evolved on this planet, liquid water is essential. Without liquid water, we would not be here. So one way of looking for possible areas where life exists is to look for other places where there's liquid water. And it seems then a pretty reasonable uh, guess that life either exists there, did exist there, or will exist there at some point in the future. So that's where this concept of habitable zones comes in. Habitable zone is just the distance from a star, like the possible orbits around a star, where liquid water is possible. And that has to do with the temperature of the planet. So the closer in the planet is to the star, the warmer it's going to be generally. It'll be harder for liquid water to stay on there. If it gets too close, just heat it and boils away. If it gets too far away, then it's going to be too cold, it'll be frozen. So sometimes this zone, habitable zone, where liquid water is possible, is called the Goldilocks zone. Because you're not too close, you're not too far, you're just right. In the image here, we have our solar system, or at least part of it, and the green area is roughly where we would say the habitable zone is in our solar system, which Venus and Mars are in that region. However, Mars doesn't have an atmosphere, so it doesn't stay warm enough to keep water liquid. Venus has a tremendous atmosphere. Remember that runaway sort of greenhouse effect where it's just too hot, water boils. But Earth, Nice atmosphere, good distance from the sun, and just right. Up on the top is another system that we've observed, Kepler-62, and it looks like there are two planets in the habitable zone of that system. 
Okay. So these are possible areas where liquid water could be. Again, just possible. So just like in our solar system, of the three planets that are in that habitable zone, only one of them has water. So it's sort of a bit of a numbers game there. Just being possible doesn't necessarily mean that there is water. There's some other general properties sort of sum up of what we've found of other planetary systems. So for one, there are plenty of systems that are like ours, meaning that they have planets that orbit in uh, circular orbits, or orbits that are almost circles. Those orbits have low eccentricity, just like the planets in our solar system. The inner planets are generally smaller, just like our system. However, there are also plenty of systems that are not really that much like ours either. That being like high eccentricity, so their orbits are not very circular, they're all much more elliptical. There are plenty of systems we found with very large inner planets, and those, I think I mentioned before, we've typically dubbed as hot Jupiters. It's very large, they're like the size of Jupiter, they're probably gas giants, but they're so close to the star that they're probably very warm. And also plenty of planets in the size ranges that we just don't have in our solar system. Right? And those are the ones like between the size of Earth and Neptune, but also ones that are larger than Jupiter, even several times larger than Jupiter. There you go, with current information that we have, observations we've made of exoplanets and such, estimate that there's something like 30 billion Earth-sized planets in our galaxy. That doesn't say anything about, you know, whether those are in habitable zones and what if they have atmospheres, anything like that, right? But just based on the size of planets alone that we've observed, the distribution of those sizes, and the amounts of planets that seem to form around stars on average, 30 billion Earth-sized planets is quite a lot. If you include that super-Earth category, right, 1.4 to 2.8 times the size of Earth, then we think there's about 100 billion of those in our galaxy alone. Yeah, boggles the mind a little bit. So the conclusion, there's a lot of planets that are like Earth, or that are probably like Earth. So even if a small fraction of those billions, tens of billions of planets, has an atmosphere that is in a reasonable zone around its star, and it probably has liquid water, which means at some point there's probably going to be some life there. That's my takeaway. Anyway, um, nobody's saying that there is life on other planets. Science doesn't work that way. You just get to say something like that until you've actually observed it. Um, but yeah, from the statistics, it seems pretty likely. This is an image that I guess that NASA commissioned probably after the Kepler mission that found so many planets, just giving a bunch of interpretations of what Earth-like planets might look like, atmospheres and maybe different colors, so their atmospheres are, have different compositions. I would say also that the idea of looking for life by looking for liquid water is probably still too narrow. You know, just because that's how life formed here, I mean, that's the only way that life would form elsewhere. We are what we call carbon-based. Most of our matter is uh, based on carbon molecules and carbon combined with other things. But there's the possibility that life could develop as other bases or from other elemental bases like silicon or phosphorus. It's hard to imagine what that life might look like, but, you know, why not? And on that note, we are done with this lecture, so I will see you at the next one. Still